what are the great cities? The kind of cities you would think of around the world, like London, Shore, Paris, New York, Tokyo, Rio. Does Norwich really belong in that kind of company? I'm not sure it does. Uh, which is a shame, but I think it is the situation. Even if you think about it just in terms of Britain in the past couple of centuries, which have been the, the great cities of modern Britain, industrial Britain, I think we think of Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, Birmingham, the great industrial cities. Sadly, Norwich really became a backwater in Paris after the 18th century, and I think it was because of the Industrial Revolution. So it's a fine city, has a lot going for it, and always has, but I'm not sure it carries on being a great city. You've already heard this stat, and I think there are some amazing stats for this. All through the Middle Ages, through into the 18th century, Norwich was the second biggest city in England, the second biggest. Even more amazing, I found out Yarmouth was the seventh biggest. Yarmouth, seventh biggest, amazing. Um, but Norwich was, was the second. That switches over, you've seen some details of that. By the time you get to 1800, Norwich has slumped down to 10th biggest. It's been overtaken by Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Bristol, Leeds, all these industrial cities. Norwich's greatness, its wealth, its size, its population, have been based, as you've heard, on its textile manufacturing, which had made it great. But it, it loses the lead in that. It loses the lead. Other centres, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, take over. Bradford and Leeds and Manchester develop new modern ways of manufacturing, and their population skyrockets, their wealth skyrockets, their significance, their greatness skyrockets, and Norwich falls down the pecking order. It becomes essentially second rate. Still a fine city, but not really a great city. What causes this as well is the Napoleonic Wars. Norwich loses its trade with the continent and falls into desperate times in the early 19th century. The textile trade collapses, it's ruined, and Norwich really, by, um, by, by the late 1700s, early 1800s, is a city really noticeable for its poverty. You've heard about public health problems, terrible housing, terrible sickness, uh, and, and a lack of wealth. Is there a revival in Victorian times? There's certainly a revival maybe in terms of the quality of housing and that sort of thing, but you can say the same for any city in, in Britain, really, to get public health improvements. But Norwich, I'm afraid, lags behind. I, I think it's really in Victorian times when Norwich becomes, gets this image of being a rather rustic city, you know, not, not a great modern industrial city, as it really had been in the past, but a, a rural city, the image it kind of has now. What does it lack? Why, why does it fall into the backwater? Well, until the 1960s, there's no university. You know, how can you be a great, how can you be a great Victorian or early 20th century <coughs> city without even a single university? It has no role, really, in Victorian times in the new industries, the new manufacturers, the new technologies that are coming along. Maybe, yes, this is happening more recently. I think one thing we could explore is possibly the idea that Norwich has, has had a revival in the past 30 or 40 years. But the topic I was given to talk on, after 1715, no, I think it, I think it declines, sadly. It doesn't, this isn't a cultural centre. Even thinking in, in modern terms, do you associate Norwich with any music movements, anything in the cinema, anything in the arts? Not really. It, it's, it, it just isn't up there with other cities that, even in Britain, that are important for the arts, for culture you might associate certain music, film, uh, writers, that sort of thing with. I think, to leave you with a couple of things, because time is nearly up, um, for me, Norwich is, well, what its football team represents. Not quite good enough for the top division, perfectly all right for the next one down, but not Premier League, and that's a shame. And for me, for me, finally, the real symbol of how Norwich sadly lost its greatness not called Norwich Union anymore, it's called Aviva, because nobody around the world has heard of Norwich. I think it's very sad, but it's a sign it's not a great city anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much, I'm going to call upon Alex Atherton to oppose the motion. to argue that Norwich has by no means lost its greatness since 1750. It can't be denied that the city has experienced spells of being in the doldrums, 
but there are lots of other factors, not least the citizens of this city, that have kept the flame of Norwich's greatness alive. First of all, there's the thorny and controversial issue of migration, and there's plenty of examples of successful migration since 1750s, and the way that migrants have contributed to the city's wealth, its cultural diversity, as well as demonstrating that tolerant nature of Norwich citizens in welcoming and assimilating friends from overseas. In the 19th century, a significant Italian community seeking a new life settled here and set up trades from sculptors to goldsmiths to ice cream makers. And in the second half of the 20th century, Norwich has forged twinning links with Rouen in France, Koblenz in Germany, Novi Sad in Serbia, and um, uh, I don't know, what's the last one? El Vieco in Nicaragua. Um, so these have become embodied um, Not sure what in permanent that. structures like the Novi Sad Friendship Bridge in the city. And in 2007, Norwich became the first UK city to become the international city of, um, of, of refuge. And through this scheme, it offers a polis um, politically exiled writers who have denied freedom of speech in their own countries um, a home. It's also, sorry, with its historic welcoming and tolerance of migrants, it's hardly surprising that Norwich has a long history of diverse religious groups, as we've heard. Um, and these have continued to thrive throughout, um, since the 1750 watershed. And the Quakers and Unitarians, in particular, have made their mark on the modern Norwich, both architecturally, through their businesses and their humanitarian campaigns. There's been numerous schools set up, both for the rich and the poorest children in the city. And unusual for its time, Coleman's um, set up a school for the children of its employees. And despite um, Simon's comments, um, the Norwich School of Design, opening in 1846, was one of the first of its kind in the country. And today, we boast two universities, which is a rare achievement in a relatively small city. Migrants to Norwich, various different religious groups, all people have channeled their considerable talents into industry in Norwich. Um, and it's true, we couldn't play a full role in the Industrial Revolution, but then again, the city has demonstrated an incredible ability to reinvent itself. And I can't deny that the textile industry wasn't able to compete with the mechanised output from the north, but the boot and shoe industry, okay, became, you know, replaced it in terms of, of employment. And the Norvik factory on Colgate was the biggest shoe factory um, in the late 19th century in the whole country. Um, dramatic fall in revenue from um, textiles, but then again, the Norwich shawl became the Gucci handbag, the designer gown um, of the mid-19th century, with stunning designs draped over Victorian crinolines across the salons of Europe, not just England. Our agricultural hinterland, fantastic breweries. The Anchor Brewery covered seven acres, and today we've got the Fat Cat pub in Adelaide Street, which brews its own beer and is one of only two pubs in the UK which has won Pub of the Year twice from Canberra. Many industries have become world brands, lots of these have been mentioned. Um, and I'm just going to pick out Lawrence and Scott's Electro Motors. You know, they diversified through two world wars and its motors now power oil rigs, submarines, they helped to build the Channel Tunnel and it's a premier pr producer of electric motors. Um, we've also had um, entrepreneurs. Did you know that um, Parliament's daily proceedings are recorded in Hansard? He was born in Norwich. He was just a, a printer. He did an apprenticeship. He moved to London, but he was so fast at setting up his print, it was adopted and it's been called Hansard ever since. He was a Norwich boy, born and bred, a bit like me, only I'm a girl. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, we had provincial newspapers, 
long before 1750, but again, that relationship with the media has continued with the regional HQ for BBC in the East, for Anglia Television. Um, and indeed, Norwich was the first city to have its own municipally um, owned library. It was the first city to adopt the Libraries Act in the mid-19th century. And of course, the Millennium Library today regularly has the biggest footfall um, in any public library in the UK. So it's no surprise that Norwich was designated the first city in Europe to be a city of literature in 2014. Cultural opportunities for both the elite and the workers are limitless. Norwich was home to the first, no, sorry, the second purpose-built theatre in England, outside London, <laughs> that one again. They had the Georgian Assembly Rooms. But in the 20th century, Charlie Chaplin, Cary Grant, Gracie Fields, all played at the Norwich Hippodrome. Um, and post-war, Laurel and Hardy, Morecambe and Wise, the Goons, all appeared in the city. The Madame Market Theatre opened in 1921, achieving two national firsts. Um, the first recreated Elizabethan theatre in the UK and the first to stage all of Shakespeare's plays as they were originally intended. And today, of course, we have one of only two dedicated puppet theatres in the UK. Music and the arts play a role in Norwich greatness. The inventor of the Do-Re-Mi scale was born here, the first principal of the Royal Academy of Music. We're home to the second oldest music festival in the country, and Sir Edward Elgar conducted here in 1908. More recently, Cream, Jimi Hendrix, David Bowie, Rod Stewart all performed at the Oldford Cellar opposite Debenhams as it was regarded as the place to try out new acts before they went on national tour. The Norwich School of Artists began in 1803 and as Frank said, the only British city to have a school of painters named after it, which endured for over a hundred years. And John Crowe, one of its prime painters, came to rank with Turner and Constable, alas, only after his death, but even so. Um, it's also produced our fair scare at the fair of writers, um, Anna Seale, author of the children's classic Bat Beauty, and Delia Smith, world's best-selling cookery author, calls Norwich her home. The first purpose-built museum in Britain opened here, and we boast the Archive Centre, one of the most up-to-date archive centres in Europe. Um, women, Elizabeth Fry, who adorned our five-pound notes until the plastic ones came in, um, prison reform, massive input there. Um, Amelia Opie, Hamrick Marsno, <coughs> took on campaigns for the underdogs in 19th century society. Dorothy Jewson was elected MP for Norwich in 1923, becoming one of the first female MPs in Britain. And Edith Cavill, heroine and martyr of the First World War, also came from Norwich. And finally, the area of science, okay, um, which has really come to a fore since 1750. I know the health things were bad, but the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital employed some of the first surgeons to use um, anaesthetics and antiseptics. Jenny Lind Hospital, the first hospital outside London for children, opened here. Um, and Coleman's first factory to employ an industrial nurse in the country. And of course now we have the research park, which is put in Norwich on the global scientific stage. So, my fellow citizens, I would feel hand on heart that the last 270 years have simply built on and enhanced Norwich's ranking as a great city of the 18th, the 19th, the 20th, and now the 21st centuries. And 1750 does not spell the beginning of the end, but the continuation of its greatness. <laughs>